Welcome to this week's episode of The Michael Hyatt Show. We're going to be starting in just a moment, but I am so glad you guys are here. We missed last week because here in the U.S. it was Independence Day. But we'd love to have your friends on with us, too. So please, while we're waiting for everybody to get on, just click the share button now to invite them to join. So while we're waiting, um, let's just chat for a minute. So where are you guys watching from? I'm watching from Nashville. Anytime I'm broadcasting, I'm usually in my studio here in Nashville. But man, is it hot outside. This is like the hottest day we've had. It's in the low 90s. And I can tell because my studio is on the second floor of my house and all the heat's rising. So it's a little bit warm. So if I start sweating, you'll know it's uh, not because I'm nervous, but because uh, the heat outside. I've got a very special show planned for today with John Gordon, who's the author of The Power of Positive Leadership. Very exciting show. If you're in leadership, you're not going to want to miss this. So again, I want to encourage you to share with your friends. And in the meantime, I'm going to go over to the comment cam and I want to hear where you're watching from. Let's see where people are from today. So over on um, Periscope, got people from St. Petersburg. I'm going to try to refresh this app because I don't got to have this broadcast thing working, Matt. So that's why we have this little pre-show, right? I want this to work. Okay, let's see if that helps. We'll see if we can connect. All right, in the meantime, I see uh, on YouTube, Linda, north of Chicago, about to rain here, dreary. I would welcome some rain, although we've had probably too much rain. A beautiful horizon. I've been thinking about the word positive lately, and I want to be a positive person and be around positive people. Me too. All right, Mark on Facebook, uh, watching from Buffalo Prairie, Illinois. Yep, a.k.a. middle of nowhere. <laughs> So uh, Bobby says you lost your audio volume. I wonder if it's this mic, it's, it's pointing down to me, so maybe that's, I don't know. Uh, sound is off on the comment cam. I don't know that that's possible, but we'll, Matt's gonna check it, he's my producer. This is the perfect time to do this. The sound suddenly became much quieter. All right, well, we'll get that adjusted while we're sitting here. In the meantime, I'm gonna see if I can get these comments up in their own window on Facebook. Facebook's always a little bit of a challenge there we go. All right, Christopher, watching from the Liberian capital, Monrovia. Mark, already got him. All right, let's see here. Coulter from Cupertino. Matt, can you tell if that's still down? Can you guys, is the sound any better now? Don from Kansas. Kent. Yeah, he says... Um, the Michael Hyatt uh, show starting time has changed from 7 p.m. to 3.50 p.m. Central Standard Time. I will miss them since I'm working. Is this the permanent change? Yeah, it is, because this works, frankly, better with my schedule. So what time zone is this in? Hey, you're watching it whatever time zone you're in. <laughs> but I'm broadcasting uh, Central Time. The cool thing about Facebook is that it will adjust your, your time zone based on where you're logging in from. They used to have a time zone preference. Not anymore. Wherever you log in from, it's going to tell, magically, where you're calling from, and it will uh, put the right time zone and display the time in the right uh, position as well. So, is the sound any better, guys? All right, I'm going to go back over to... It should be a little better. Let's should see. be a little better? Yeah. All right. I'm trying to figure out the comments here. Okay, Bobby says, sound is 1010 here in South Euclid, Ohio. Fantastic. Yep, Mark, there still is the video to watch it again. So one of the cool things is, is that Facebook automatically records any of these broadcasts, and they're available instantly, or almost instantly for replay, which is really cool. It's one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons I like it. Kurt said, appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Nancy calling in or watching in from Wichita, Kansas. Fantastic. All right. Okay, I got another question to ask you guys, so let me just go back over to my notes here. Oh, how fun. My mom is on. Mom, happy birthday again. So my mom's birthday was yesterday, and I don't think she'd mind me telling you this. She turned 83. I promise you, she looks like she's in her early 70s. She's one of the most joyful, pleasant, and John, you'll appreciate this, one of the most consistently positive people I've ever known. I mean, she rarely complains. She always sees, you know, the upside. She's such a great encouragement, but I'm blessed 
to have her in my life. And for that matter, my dad's the same way. I mean, so positive, so uplifting, so encouraging. So I, I, I mean, I don't even know. That's such a gift. I don't, I don't know what you do if you don't have that. But I've been blessed to have that. I know it's a gift. Okay, another question. All right, as a leader, do you consider yourself, be honest now, let's just pretend it's like us, okay? We're on the honest planet. And as a leader, do you consider yourself more of an optimist or a pessimist? Okay, and I'm going to tell you a little story. So when I started in my career, um, early on, in the publishing industry actually, um, I, I don't know how to say this, just to say it, I was pretty full of myself. I was a little bit arrogant. And so I kind of thought it was my job as the leader of my department and then later of my division that I was the guy that had to point out where the flaws in the argument were, where things weren't quite right, what's missing, what was broken. You know, I thought, I thought that's what leaders do. You know, you got to have a leader that's smart, that sees the problems. Well, that didn't actually work. Didn't work for me too well uh, because you tend to, to get more of what you focus on. And you tend to bring out in people more what you focus on. So for me, at least in my experience, the more I focused on people's shortcomings, their negative attributes, the more that I got. And people just didn't like working for me. So I had to have a major attitude adjustment and get positive. And fortunately, I have some people in my life that have helped me do that. But I would say I'm pretty optimistic and pretty positive now. But what about you? Okay, I'm going to go back and look at the comments here. Ah, Don says better volume. Great. Ken says my wife's birthday today. This is all on Facebook. Kurt says he's an optimist. Good for you, Kurt. Mark says what if optimists to everyone else but pessimists on the inside? Well, that's a good question. We'll ask John about that when he gets on here in a minute. Okay, Michael on Periscope says optimists try to set a vision and inspire my team to work toward it. I'm going to try it one more time here on Periscope to get the comments to display like they're supposed to. So I don't know if they will or not. Oh, well. Sunny Joe's on YouTube, and she says, definitely an optimist. Ben wishes my mom happy birthday. Thank you, Ben, for that. Okay, back over on YouTube. Man, we got a lot of comments coming from everywhere. Um, so Linda wished my mom a happy birthday. A Beautiful Horizon said optimist, and Linda said an optimist for sure. I tell you, I think for most people, oh, we're just in the mic here. Is that the problem? All right. So I got a boom mic right above my head. I guess they call it a boom mic because if I move too far forward, I hit myself in the head. Boom. Ron says, optimist, hands down. Oh, this is cool. Met their senior armpit. Awesome. Oh, great. <laughs> Keeping it real here, people. Keeping it real. Is that better? Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's, yeah, that looks great to me. All right, that's exactly why we have the pre-show, so we can get everything adjusted, and then we can go all fancy when we start uh, the show. So Ken says, optimist, the glass is half full always. All right, one more question, because we've only got 46 seconds to go here. What is your greatest challenge when it comes to maintaining a positive outlook at work? I can tell you for me, and I'm just going to give you guys a chance to respond, so that's why I like to go first. For me... It's my attitude, my perspective tends to go south when I get tired. So the, the most important thing I can do to stay positive is make sure I'm getting plenty of rest, getting the right nutrition, getting exercise, kind of setting myself up uh, to win. But when I start getting negative, usually uh, Gail will say to me, my wife Gail, will say to me, honey, I think it's time for bed because she knows that it's totally different when I've had a good night's uh, sleep. So what about you? What's the biggest challenge you have? I know we're just about out of time. Uh, Lizzie Bruce is on. She says, I try to be an optimist, but I sometimes struggle to keep the pessimist side of me subsided. Man, I get it. Danny said, this is on Facebook. Danny Campbell said, the highlight of my summer was meeting John Gordon. How cool. Ron says, filtering out the negative people that I encounter. So true. Coulter says, greatest challenge in staying positive is when I start working with too many scarcity mentality people. So true. Okay, guys, we're done with the pre-show and we're just going to get started here. So again, I want to give you an opportunity before we officially start to share this. Your friends will thank you later. You're not going to want to miss this because I've got a very special guest on and we're going to be talking about the uh, positivity and leadership. So let's start. If I ask you 
To name the most important qualities a leader could possess, a number of things would probably come to mind. I mean, you might think of intelligence or charisma, decisiveness, maybe talent. Perhaps even confidence would make your list, or even humility. But few of us would likely list positivity as a top-ranking leadership trait. And yet, according to my guest today, John Gordon, our tendency to discount positivity is limiting our leadership and keeping our teams from fulfilling their highest potential. And he's here to share the power of positive leadership and how we can cultivate it. Hello, I'm Michael Hyatt. Welcome to my live show where each week I talk with a different thought leader about some aspect of personal development, productivity, or leadership. And my goal is to help you win at work, succeed at life, and lead with confidence. Let's get started. Well, I'm here with my friend John Gordon. John is a best-selling author, a speaker who has spent years researching and speaking on the subject of positive leadership. And his principles have been put to the test by Fortune 500 companies, school districts, sports teams, and nonprofits alike. In his latest book, The Power of Positive Leadership, which is terrific, John shares a very clear framework that we can use as leaders to put positivity into practice and reap the benefits in our teams and in our lives. And he's here with us today to share that framework with you. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think we were saying before the show started, that the last time we saw each other was a few years ago in San Antonio. Where we were both speaking at the same event. And uh, we didn't have much time there, but I feel like we're ships passing in the night. I wish we had more time to spend together. Oh, me too. Well, so you just made a big move. You're in California now, I guess. And um, you were telling me before the show that you were out surfing yesterday. That probably took some positivity. <laughs> it, it took a lot. I have a good friend. He's a sports psychologist for the, the Seahawks. And I texted him afterwards. He's a world-class surfer. I said, I really need some tips on surfing and also a sports psychologist right now. Because I was uh, a little down. But, you know, you fail so much with surfing. First time learning, getting on the board a couple times, but then falling every time. But it's a lot like life. You know, you get knocked down, but then you get back up. And I'm determined, though, because I, I talk about grit a lot. I talk about failing forward and staying positive through challenges. I'm determined to carry this forward because I'm going to use this as a great metaphor for life at 46 to never surf, to say, you know what? I'm going to do this, give it a shot, work with it, and, and hopefully get just a little good, you know, just a, a little good one day that I can actually get on the board and surf a little bit. That will be a big win for me. I love that. As you were talking about it when we were in the pre-show, I thought, what an awesome way to get illustrations for your speaking or for the next book. Try something brand new that everybody wants to do and then just kind of report back. So I'm sure it'll be a great uh, metaphor as well. Well, I want to dive into your book and just this whole topic of positivity because I think that it's a key component of effective leadership. But I think positivity tends to be perceived as a personality trait rather than a leadership skill. And is it really, in your opinion, a skill that we can cultivate? You know, it really is. I, I want people to know, first off, that I'm not naturally positive. So I'm not Mr. Positive just trying to say, okay, everyone needs to be positive. I'm actually someone who is quite negative, dealt with a lot of negativity in my life, so much so that my wife threatened to leave me because I was so miserable and negative. And that's what began my journey of saying, how, how, how can I be more positive? How can I be someone who brings out the best in others, but also feels good about myself? So it became, it, be, it became a life mission. It became something that I began to work on for myself. And as I started to do these tips and write these different articles about what I was doing, I began to share them. And it led me to my life's work. I know that being positive doesn't just make you better. It makes everyone around you better. My daughter even wrote a college essay and the essay was, when I was young, my mom struggled with her health, and my dad struggled with himself. But I watched as my dad worked to become a more positive person. And as he did, he started to write and speak and share this message. And I saw him change and other people change. So I believe the world can change. And I know that you know, being a more positive person, it made me a better father. 
And it brought tears to my eyes reading that because I saw firsthand the impact it has. So it's a skill that we can develop. It's a way to live. It's a perspective. It's a way to approach life. It's a way to lead others. And it's not just a nice way to live and lead. It's the ultimate way because that's how we are most productive. That is how we get the most out of other people to help them be their best. And so all the research shows this. So again, I want to make it clear that this is not Pollyanna positive. This is the real positivity that makes great leaders great. Hmm. Awesome. I just remembered something. Um, when I was a senior in high school, my dad, this is the only time he ever did this. He paid me to read a book. He paid me 20 bu bucks if I would read a book. And it was Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. And that was like, I don't know, 50... 40 some odd years ago. And uh, it was hugely helpful to me. But anyway, just thought you'd appreciate that. I love so that. What results have you seen positive leadership produce for yourself and for your clients? Well, Clemson football is one of my clients. So Dabo Sweeney, one of the greatest positive leaders I've ever met. And just a great example of what positivity does. Because when he took over that job, there was a lot of negativity at Clemson. He brought two signs into the meeting room with the team for his first meeting. One was believe. Another sign was I can't with the T crossed out. It's like, no, we are going to be about belief. And he set out to instill this belief, this optimism, this positivity in the Clemson football program. And I have guys that I've met that were on that team that said he just changed the culture immediately from his positive leadership, from his belief. It wasn't success overnight. They had a lot of challenges. Six and seven in 2010, but then in 2011, they won 10 games. After that, 11 games. And then they won a national championship last year after losing the national championship the year before to Alabama. So we see a coach, we see a leader go through adversity, go through struggle, lose a national championship in front of millions of people. And I'm in the locker room with the team when they lost the national championship two years ago. And Dabo says, guys, we just didn't make enough plays to beat a team as good as Alabama. You can't make the mistakes that we made and beat a team as good as that. But let me tell you something. We're coming back because here's why. And he set out to talk about how they were coming back. He told the seniors how thankful he was for their leadership. He said, I've never been more proud of a group of men than I am of you tonight. And he talked about the future and what they were going to do. He just lost a national championship. He wasn't wallowing. He was focusing on the future. Same thing with Alan Mullally. Alan Mullally turned around Ford in 2006, one of the greatest leadership in feats, feats in history because they had just lost $14 billion. He had them profitable in a few short years. I talked to Alan for this book, The Power of Positive Leadership, and he said he defined his leadership style as positive leadership. And it was a huge part of overcoming all the adversity, all the challenges that Ford was facing. There are a lot of cynics, there are a lot of critics, there are a lot of naysayers, but we know that pessimists don't create the future, right? Mm -hmm. Naysayers talk yeah. about problems, True. but they don't solve them. Critics write words, but they don't write the future. Throughout history, we see people like Alan, who their positivity, their belief, their leadership are the ones who change the world. And again, a great example of that. Okay, so these are, these are great examples because here he just lost this season. And on the eve of that, he's focused on what's positive. But as a leader, I don't know, I've always been struck by um, the Stockdale paradox that Jim Collins talks about in Good to Great. Yes. And where, you know, the, the leader uh, is always optimistic about ultimate triumph, but is realistic about the struggles. So how do you see this working itself out in the life of a leader? How can you be, on the one hand, optimistic and positive with your leadership about the future but be realistic with the challenges that you face. How do you, how do you do that in the moment? So you accept the challenges that you have. You confront the reality. Okay, we just lost. This is not good. We just had this setback. We're here today, but here is where we're going. Here is our vision for the road ahead. See, positive leaders, they lead with vision. It's a big part of the book. So they have a vision for the road ahead. They have a North Star. They know where they're going and they're continually rallying people towards it. So yes, we have the setback. Our vision's not looking good right now, but here is where we're going. So you confront the challenges, you address the issues, you solve the problems, but you're always pointing your team forward. You're not focused on mm. the problems. You're focused on the solutions 
to the problems. And I think a lot of times we can dwell on the problems. We can complain about things. And I love what Alan Mulally said. He said, complaining is not an option. Wallowing is not a plan. This was in 2008. Ford had done everything right to you know, address their dysfunctions, to address their regionalism, to get people on board, to get them buy in, to increase engagement. So they were doing everything right. They were making great cars again. But now in 2008, no one was buying cars. So everyone was just freaking out. But Alan stayed steadfast saying, we have a plan. We need to adapt and adjust. We will, but we have a plan. We have a vision. We're going to continue to work towards it. He said, everyone has to know the plan, embrace the plan, and relentlessly work towards the plan. So again, in the moment, you're addressing the challenges, but you're always optimistic about the future. So I often say, I say, I'm a pessimistic optimist, which I think I am. <laughs> because what happens is I, I get a little down at first, but then I always seem to have this eternal hope that it's going to be better, that the best is yet to come. And then you work towards it. And the research though shows, this is, this is so key, Michael, that the, the research shows that the positive, optimistic people, they work harder, they get paid more, and they're more likely to succeed in business and sports. And what the research shows is because they believe in a brighter and better future, they believe in it, they actually work harder to create it. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, I, I totally believe that, and I get it. And by the way, if you guys are getting value out of this, if you're finding it helpful, I want to encourage you to do two things. First of all, share by clicking on the share button, whether you're on YouTube or Periscope or Facebook. And also, if you've got questions, put them in the comments because I'm going to be going to the questions here in just a minute. This is your chance to ask the guy who literally wrote the book on it. And if you're in a position of leadership and think that your leadership could be more effective if you were more positive, this is the opportunity to get out your objections, your concerns, or if you just want some tips and, and strategies, John's here uh, to help with that. John, one of the things I was thinking as you were talking, um, it, it's almost like you're, what I hear you saying is that for a leader, he puts challenges in the context of a larger win. In other words, constantly focused on the big picture of where we're going. I've known leaders that do the exact opposite. So for example, you talked about 2008. At the time I was CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers, we were acquired by private equity. And those were grueling years as we went through the recession, 2009 as it drug into 2010. And I remember when we would have positive news, something good would happen, for whatever reason, so many of those guys would look at that and put it in the context of the negative, you know, put it in a larger negative context. So they would kind of almost be dismissive of the positive and continually reaffirm the negative, which as a leader made it really challenging for me to lead my team because I wanted to do the exact opposite. But have you seen that in leadership sometimes where, where people get it backwards? Oh, very much so. I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is because there's so much negative leadership out there. There are negative leaders who are draining their teams. They're sabotaging their inspiration and their purpose and their passion. And ultimately, the teams suffer from that. And so my goal is to really create a framework and, and share this research and understanding that positive leaders can say, okay, here's how I can be a positive leader. Here's how I actually live and breathe it each day. Here's how I put it into action. And here's how we do it with other people. So a positive leader does not succeed alone, right? They do it with other people and with a team. So you have to be so positive, why? So you can actually lead others who are dealing with their own negativity. So many people are filled with fear. And I would say these positive leaders you're talking about, the reason why they're going negative is because, oh, they're not positive. I mean, they're the leaders you're talking about, they are, they're so negative because they're being led by fear and they're leading with fear. Instead, you need leaders who lead with faith because your teams are fearful. Your family is fearful. The people you lead are afraid. And so you have to have the faith to move them forward. And your faith must be greater than their fear. Your belief, your optimism, your positivity must be greater than all the negativity and doubt. And the way we lead that way, though, also is through relationships. A big part of this book and what I write about is positive leaders build great relationships and teams by uniting the organization and connecting with the individual. So I don't believe you can lead other people unless you have a relationship with them or some mm -hmm. connection to them. And what I have found is that positive leaders really connect with their people in an emotional way that drives inspiration, drives purpose, and allows people to actually want to stay on the bus and move forward with their leader. Yeah, that's very good. 
Yeah, I've noticed that as a leader that people really pick up on my fear or my anxiety or my doubt, and worse, it gets amplified. So it's like the old saying goes, you know, if, if I sneeze, they catch a cold. And so yeah. I think as, it seems like as leaders, we've got to be particularly mindful, or, or I should say self-aware, aware of what impact our vocabulary is having, our actions are having, and how our thinking's manifesting itself in both of those. But what first led you to study positive psychology and the habits of positive leaders? Where did that come from? I think it came from my own journey of wanting to be positive myself. I mean, my dad, you talk about your parents and how positive they were. My dad was not very positive. He was a New York City police officer, undercover narcotics. He was shot a few times. My dad was not too big on positive energy, you know? <laughs> He's a very a loving man, a very, very loving man, but just one of the most negative guys on the planet. He'd say, hey, good morning, dad. He'd say, what's so good about it? <laughs> so my dad was Al Bundy before Al Bundy was Al Bundy. And I often joke, but it's true, I grew up in a Jewish Italian family, a lot of food, a lot of guilt. So I believe that growing up in the environment I grew up in, it just made me want to pursue positivity to be more positive myself. Mm -hmm. Then somehow I just started to get brought into all these teams and organizations that read the energy bus, who were really all about building a positive team that gets on the bus, moves in the right direction with shared vision, focus and purpose, all these corporations and so forth. And then naturally started to see how these positive leaders were making a difference. And I thought, you know, I need to write about this. I need to share what I'm seeing. We need to dispel the myth of positivity being Pollyanna. Some people yes. believe that, you, have to, you know, they, they say you have to choose between positivity and winning. I believe positivity leads to winning. Positive leaders are demanding. Let's get that straight. They're just not demeaning. And one of the other keys that I talk about that is essential. Positive leaders provide both love and accountability essential mm. love and accountability. So I, I love you. I love you. And I'm also going to challenge you to be your best. I'm not going to let you settle for anything less than, than being your best so you can bring our best to the team. And so we're not just here to hold hands and, and sing Kumbaya. We're here to do great things together, to pursue excellence, to have grit, to fight the good fight, and ultimately achieve greatness. Because let's face it, if we truly want to change the world, we got to do it with excellence to create something great for mm. the world. And that's the only way to do it. So so I really was was meeting all these leaders out there that were, weren't positive Pollyanna. They were like great leaders who were very positive. Their teams loved them, but man, they drove them and pursued excellence. Like Alan told me, you gotta love them up, but you gotta hold them accountable to the culture, the principles, the values, and the process. Donna Orinder, incredible leader. She turned around the WNBA. She told me, you know, John, it's about belief, it's about being positive, but it's also about being effective. And you have to make sure you get results. So again, everyone I talked to was very grounded in reality while remaining optimistic. Super. Okay, I'm gonna get some questions here. We've had some coming in. Um, on Facebook, Nancy asked, John, did you make any diet, exercise, and or sleep changes in your journey toward positivity? Yes. And I love what you talked about, Michael, early on about making sure that you have a really good diet or when you're, you're hungry. I am most negative when I'm starving. So <laughs> I'm a big believer. Hangry. Yeah, I'm hungry. I'm a big believer in making sure that we have a diet that where you eat smaller meals throughout the day. So you don't get that drop in blood sugar level. A lot of my research early on actually was about physical energy. So I did a ton of research on diet and exercise and all that good stuff. A lot of people are negative because of their diet, believe it or not. The foods mm -hmm. that they're eating are not creating a healthy brain. I eat a lot of salmon. I eat a lot of fish. And the research is very clear that people in populations that have a lot of seafood in their diet, the dep depression, rates of depression go down significantly. Mm -hmm. So I eat, a lot of, I eat a lot of healthy foods. Exercise for me is essential to my positivity. I was an athlete in college. I find that if I'm not exercising, I'm not at my best, you know, being positive. And then sleep. If yeah. you're not getting enough sleep, I mean, you will not be at your best. All the research shows today that most Americans are getting less sleep than they need, a lot less. We're getting caught up in our phones and technology, and we're not sleeping enough. So you need that sleep to recharge your body. So again, these are just some, some really elements of positivity. I didn't write about this in this book. But it's just something I just know a lot about because when I live it and also I researched it a lot in the years past. Great. Thanks for sharing that. 
Okay, Renee Lopez on Facebook asked, Hey, John, I've recently been doing a coaching education for high school coaches who struggle with helping their athletes with confidence. How can they be the positive leader specifically for those struggling with confidence? Well, I would say a lot of our kids have a struggle with confidence. A lot of human mm -hmm. beings have struggled with confidence. I work with a lot of professional athletes and big time college athletes, for instance, and they struggle with confidence. To be human is to struggle with confidence. To be human is to have negative thoughts. Well, we can teach kids today, the most important thing we can teach them, Renee, is that your negative thoughts do not come from you. Don't blame yourself for the negative thoughts because who would ever choose to have a negative thought? Negative thoughts exist in consciousness, right? People have to understand that it's a, a thoughts are spiritual. It's like a spiritual battle. And so just because you have a negative thought when it comes in doesn't mean you have to believe it. Mm -hmm. You can see that thought for what it is. So we can teach kids that those thoughts that are coming in, those negative thoughts are things that you can ignore or you don't have to believe. And instead you can know the truth. And then we can teach them what the truth is. The truth is that you're capable in any moment of being your best. The truth is you can be great even when you don't feel great. The truth is that we can feed that positive dog instead of the negative dog. So when those negative thoughts come in, don't feed that negative dog, starve, starve the negative dog, feed that positive dog. So that is what breeds and grows. And then the story that we tell ourselves, ultimately the story that we tell ourselves through challenges, as our friend Donald Miller talks about, right? We're all living a movie. Are you the hero or the victim in that story? And the more you tell yourself a positive story through the challenges and you see your life as an inspirational tale, not you know a drama, not a horror story. No, you get knocked down, it's an inspirational tale and you can come back and be your best. That's the key. I talked to a professional field goal kicker in the NFL who said some of his greatest kicks were when he was actually least confident, that he just kicked it as hard as he could and almost closed his eyes, looked up and saw it go in. And so I tell this to kids to say, you know what? Guys like that aren't always confident. You won't always be either. Just continue to move forward, stay the course, and just do what you do. And don't fear failure. Just be your best. Let God do the rest. You know, my, um, my coach, Dan Sullivan, makes a distinction between courage and confidence. And he mm. says they look exactly the same on the outside, but inside it's really different. So when you're being courageous, you don't always feel confident. You may have fear but you're taking action in spite of that fear and you believe that, you know, eventually you'll feel confident, but usually not at the beginning. So that's good. Well, that's really good. Okay. So one follow-up question, this is from YouTube, a beautiful horizon asks, how many hours of sleep per night do you suggest? I can't give that research because I know the research, James Moss, who wrote power sleep, he suggests between you know seven and eight hours. But I also believe, I, I also know it depends on each person. And each person requires different amounts of sleep. So what I would say is you get the amount of sleep that makes you feel great, that makes you feel alive, that makes you feel energized. So for me, it's between seven and eight hours. I'm at my best. Five hours, not so good. But my good buddy, Dan Britton, he only needs like four hours a night. He's one of those lucky people that doesn't need to sleep much. But for me, I need more sleep. So I believe you find your own optimal amount of sleep. Just do some tests with it. And just like diet, like I eat certain foods that make me feel great. And I'll stay away from foods that don't make mm -hmm. me feel great. So my wife could eat, you know, she could eat meat. She's, I don't do well with meat. I'm actually, I've developed an allergy to meat, which is really painful because I miss steak a lot. But I feel great when I eat seafood. So that's what I eat. Yeah, great. By the way, I've had Sean Stevenson on the show and he wrote a book called Sleep Smarter. And it's a mm -hmm. great book on sleep for those of you that haven't read it. But uh, one of the things he points out is that the elite athletes, the more elite you are, the more sleep you get. Olympians, mm -hmm. nine, 10 hours sleep is not unusual because they need that to perform at their uh, peak. So, okay, so I'm gonna go on to another question here. Um, what has been, for you, John, the single most impactful practice in helping you become a more positive leader? Could you boil it down to that for us? Yes, I can boil it down to, to one thing. I started doing a thank you walk years ago during this time when my wife had had enough of my negativity i said all right i'm gonna start feeding that positive dog each day and i started taking a walk of gratitude i found this research that said you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time so if you're feeling blessed you won't be stressed i also found research that talked about exercise 
So I combine the two together in a walk. And then while I'm walking, I just say what I'm thankful for. And I also pray during this walk. For me, prayer and gratitude just feed my body and soul, my mind and, and brain with these positive emotions that uplift you rather than the stress hormones that slowly drain and the research shows actually slowly kill you. So just by doing this walk of gratitude every day, you're creating a fertile mind that's just ready for great things to happen, that's, that's ready for success. Now, think of your mind like a garden. You do this for one day. It's not gonna do a whole lot, but if you weed the negative and feed the positive for a week, for a month, seven years, a lifetime, that garden becomes magnificent. This is the power of doing that exercise on a daily basis. I also love success of the day at night. Like, what was the one great thing that happened to you that day? And then you celebrate your successes every day. And what happens is each night you go to bed, you're, you're, you're leaving this day, going to bed on a good note, thinking about something positive. You wake up, you're ready for something great to happen. You're ready to take on the day. And then you're looking for what's going to be my success today. And as you know, as you said earlier, Michael, the more you look for something, the more you find it. It starts to show up for it. So true. Okay, thank you. Hey, guys, I just want to encourage you, ask your questions. You've got John here. We've got him just for a few more minutes, so I don't want you to miss something that after the show you go, oh, if I'd only asked that. Okay, I wanted to get back to the book here. In the book, you outline a nine-part framework for putting positive leadership into action, and I don't want to ask you to recount the whole book. People can buy it, and I'll give them the link to that here in a minute. But can you summarize that framework for us and help us understand a little bit about how that works? Sure. Well, first and foremost, positive leaders, what do they do? They drive positive cultures. Culture isn't just one thing, it's everything. So as a positive leader, you can't delegate it. You create your culture, most important thing you can do. Positive leaders create a vision for the road ahead that inspires their team towards the future. So positive leaders, they lead with that vision. They also lead with optimism and belief. That's the next part of the framework, and we talked about that, right? If you don't have it, you can't share it. So you need to make sure you're feeding yourself with that positivity so you can then share it with others. Positive leaders also do with negativity. So they confront it. They then try to transform it. If they can't transform it, they then remove it. But a big thing here is don't be negative about negativity. A lot of people say, well, I just deal with the negativity. You're either on my bus or off my bus. No, it's not meant to be that way. The first goal is to transform, help someone who's negative become more positive. If they don't get on the bus, if they just are negative and they're sabotaging the ride to everybody on your team, in your organization, in your office, then you have to remove them and let them off the bus. And then the next part of the framework is positive leaders. They create unity. They unite the organization. And that's essential. Alan Mullally did it. Clemson, Davos Sweeney does it. They just are able to bring people together to work together to create something amazing. So positive leaders do that. But then they also build great relationships and teams. And I talked about that earlier. You cannot succeed without other people. And so positive leaders, they drive relationships. They invest in relationships. They encourage. They praise. They recognize. They mentor. They guide. And most of all, they love. And I can tell you so many great stories that are in this book about how these positive leaders loved others and then transformed the people they loved. And those people went on to do incredible things on the team and in the organization. Positive leaders, the next part of the framework, they pursue excellence, right? we talked about that earlier. They're here to do something great, to accomplish greatness. So let's not ignore that. Positive leaders also though, they have grit. And this is one of my favorite things is that positive leaders, they don't give up. As a positive leader, you'll be confronted with all sorts of challenges, adversity, and failures. But what you see throughout history, the people who change the world, they turn their failures into opportunities. They turn their struggles into victories and triumphs. And because they did, we have the world that we have. And Michael, I would say that you're a great example of that positive leader, right? Wherever you've been, you transform the organization and the team where you've been. And now you're transforming the world with your message. Yes, you've had struggles, I've had struggles, but we don't let those struggles that define us, they refine us to be all that we're meant to be. And you don't do that without grit. Grit is the number one predictor and factor of success. And positive leaders have a lot of it. So that's the framework. Fantastic. There's so many sound bites in what you just said. Uh, just as a follow-up with about the negative people that are surrounding us. So on Facebook, Teresa Singletary asked, when you are naturally positive, there are others who are just not fans of that positivity. It just seems to get under their skin. What is your advice for handling those folks and situations? 
Boy, I've experienced that. You? Yeah. I wrote this in the book. We don't create a world outside in. We create it inside out. So mm -hmm. don't look to the outside and let the outside create you. You just create your outside by shining your light. You just be you. You shine your light. Energy vampires don't like the light. So the more you shine, they will run or they will be transformed. And this doesn't mean false positivity either. Just be real, be genuine, love, serve, and care. We have a program, a training program called Driver of Positive Change. We have a thing where we have the manager write a love letter to their energy vampire. It's called Love Letter to an Energy Vampire. And what this letter is, awesome. yeah, it's a cool exercise where it's a letter of encouragement. You actually write this letter, you find the good in that person. And you let this person know what you appreciate them and you encourage them in this letter. We had a manager do that. We got an email a few weeks ago. She said, she sent the letter, they met, they talked for two hours to find, it, it changed, to find the relationship going forward. It changed everything. Now they're totally together. This person's on the bus, and the manager said it, it changed your leadership style now. So that's why I'm a big believer in, in making sure that we first have to confront, but then we try to transform, we make sure we love others, and that's a positive leadership. That's great. Fantastic. Okay, another question from Facebook. Donald Newman asks, what are some of the greatest positive leaders in history that you look to, John Gordon, as examples? Well, Abraham Lincoln, no doubt about it, because... He suffered nine election defeats, the death of a fiance, a nervous breakdown, and two bankruptcies before becoming president of the United States. Now, people would say he actually dealt with depression. He may not have seemed very positive. But again, he had this eternal hope. He had this optimism. And he led this country through the most challenging time in our history. And so you see his positive leadership, and you see how he changed the world. And again, Alan Mulally, I, I got to say, like, just talking to him for an hour it was like getting an MBA in that hour. Mm -hmm. I was just blown away by what he did. He, he's, you know, he, he literally saved for 50,000 jobs, turned around the company, one of the greatest leadership feats in history. So he's one of my new favorites. And Davos Sweeney at Clemson, I've worked with a lot of leaders. He leads with love and accountability like no other. I've never been more impressed with another coach or another human being than I have just being with him. And anyone who meets him, says the same thing, just just incredible leader. So those are, are a few of my favorites. Uh, you know, many other people in the book, Scott Harrison with Charity Water, Bob Goff, as you know, one of the most positive people on the planet. Crazy positive. I mean, if, yeah, if, if, you know, like, I would just love to be Bob Goff for just a day. You know, I, I'm, I, I don't think we should try to be anyone else, but just the love that he has, <laughs> and how he shares it. You can tell, like, I want that. Like, like more for me because I'm not naturally that way. I have to work on it, but it just oozes out of me. Yeah, if I, I think if I could distill the essence of Bob's personality, I could make a gazillion dollars in selling it because he he's a great example. And, and you know what it is, really, all positivity ultimately comes from love. Like it if does. you love it, if you love it, you won't fear it. So I would tell people watching this, like, don't focus on positivity, focus on love. Oh, that's focus good. on passion. Focus on purpose. When you're living your purpose and you're passionate and you love, positivity is a natural byproduct of that. That's fantastic. Okay, here's another question from Facebook. Uh, Michael Holland asks, this is a great question. John, what advice do you have to help leaders appear more authentic in being positive while they're still growing in their positivity? So they're not quite there yet. What do they do in the meantime? Okay, you can't be positive just to check a box or because the book says to like, okay, I'm gonna appear more positive. It, it really must come from the heart. So what I would say is to appear more positive is to be more genuine, to be more loving, is to look for ways, I wrote about this in The Carpenter, to look for ways to love and serve and care. If you love, serve and care, and that's your focus in every interaction, you will be a positive leader and you will share your positivity with others through the greatest, what I believe the greatest leadership principles of all are love, serve, and care. Mm, perfect. Okay, I've got one last question here. We're almost out of time, but I think this one is important. What advice would you give to the leaders watching who consider themselves maybe a little bit pessimistic? What is the first step that they can take toward practicing positive leadership? So if you 
be a little pessimistic yourself, then what I would do is I would identify like your vision of where you want to go in the future. Like really pick your vision that energizes you because maybe there's a reason why you're feeling a little pessimistic. So, so what wakes you up? What makes you feel alive? So pick one vision that will energize you. Then I would actually pick one technique, one strategy, one principle that allows you to be more positive. Might be a thank you walk, might be the success, the night might be uh, success of the night, might be tell yourself a positive story. In the book, I give a lot of different examples of what people can do to be more positive. Also wrote a book called The Positive Dog, which are a lot of strategies in there to be more positive. <laughs> Pick one strategy to be more positive. We actually created a free seven step plan free seven step plan called the power of positive you. And again, give that to people so that they can begin the process of being more positive. You don't have to buy anything. You can just have that plan. And that would be a way to get started on picking your vision, picking your strategy, picking uh, the one thing that's holding you back. And then you pick your one word, the one word that's going to drive you to be your best. And that's a great way to stay positive as well. That's super. And I think even for those of us that kind of consider ourselves positive, that if we don't have some practice that we're doing on a regular basis. I mean, everything's negative in the world. This is one of the reasons I don't watch the news because it's one negative thing after another. And they, of course, that whole uh, business model is built on scaring you so you don't stop watching TV. And I just, you know, I'm not going to play the game. So I think even for those of us that are positive, if we're not actively pursuing positivity, it's pretty easy with all the forces that we face just in the world, we're going we're gonna to roll backwards. So I like what you're saying, even for those of us that consider ourselves uh, Optimus. John, we're just about out of time, but I wonder if you've got any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience today. Yeah, based on what you just said and the negativity in the world, Mike, I mean, we're bombarded with it, turn on social media. People are allowing the presidential actions and Twitter and the social media and the news to just get them down. But I want to encourage people to take Dr. James Gill's advice. He's the only person on the planet to complete six double Ironman triathlons, which means you do, you do an Ironman, 24 hours later you do another one. And wow. the last time he did, yeah, the last time he did it, 59 years old. So he was asked how he did it. He said, I've learned to talk to myself instead of listen to myself. So if I listen to myself, I hear all the fear, all the doubt, all the complaints, and all the noise. But if I talk to myself, I can feed myself with the words and the encouragement that I need to keep on moving forward. He would memorize and recite scripture, and that's what fueled him. You can pick the words that energize and fuel you, but just on a daily basis, we have to have this thing that we can hold on to through all the negativity. And just remember, we talk to ourselves and we create our world inside out through our love, our passion, our joy, our spirit. The outside world is circumstance, it's events. We don't allow that to affect us. We affect the world. We change the world by who we are on the inside. And so every day mm -hmm. we just focus on we can do each day to make a difference. That is so powerful. Talk to ourselves rather than listen to ourselves. John, thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you guys for joining us. If you haven't done so already, please pick up a copy of John's new book, The Power of Positive Leadership, How and Why Positive Leaders Transform Teams and Organizations and Change the World. And you can order a copy on Amazon at michaelhyatt.com slash positive leadership. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Michael Hyatt Show. I'm not going to be on the show next week because I'm going to be traveling, but I look forward to being with you in two weeks, same time, same place, at 4 o'clock Central. I'll be interviewing popular author John Rulin about the hidden power of generosity. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.